I'm Jahawi Batoli, eco filmmaker and wildlife specialist. And I'm Ella Meek, co founder of Kids Against Plastic and all round animal lover. Welcome to our weekly update on the health of the planet and its animals. This is The Pulse. Coming up this week... Earthshot prize winners Coral Vita on regrowing depleted coral reefs. How eco-friendly is your four-legged friend? And stand by for another crop of the more unusual eco news. Hi Jahawi, looks like a very nice warm day for you there. <laughs> hey Ella, yeah, it's actually a scorching day over here in Lamu. How are things with you? I'm good, thank you. I'm pretty freezing though. So what's caught your eye in the news this week? For me, the most exciting news has been the announcement of the Earthshot Prize winners. Now, for those of you who don't know it, this has been a prize that was set up by Prince William to honor people and organizations that are working hard to save the planet. And they each get one million pounds to further their work. Yeah, it's a really cool idea for an award. There were so many incredible people and projects there. So who really stood out for you? For me, it has to be Coral Vita. These are two best friends who came together to set up a coral regrowing project in the Bahamas and have been using some incredible science behind it to speed up the regrowth. Well, that's an incredible idea because coral reefs are hugely important being at the bottom of the food chain and also providing shelter and habitats for loads of different types of fish and animals. And I actually read a report from One Earth Scientific Journal that said coral reefs have been down 50% compared to in the 1950s, which is really shocking. That is a really scary statistic. And you know what? It's not only the environment, because it's also the communities that rely on coral reefs, mainly local and indigenous along the coast, who get their sustenance from them. So earlier, I got to speak to prize winner Sam Taika from Coral Vita to learn more about their exciting project. Firstly, a massive congratulations on winning the award. Thanks for having me on, Jahawi. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you explain the significance of what you do? The bulk of our work is focused on the fragmentation of corals. If you take one piece of coral, cut it up into all these little micro fragments, and you place them near each other, it triggers a healing process, almost like scar tissue. And then the corals will fuse back into themselves. And so instead of a brain coral growing from a coin to a dinner plate and decades, if not centuries, we can grow a brain coral to that size in a matter of months or years. We then also use uh, methods from within assisted evolution. So being able to strengthen corals resilience to climate change threats is really important. So growing the corals on land, unlike traditional underwater ocean-based farms, gives us a number of key advantages, including we control the growing conditions. There's a number of different ways you can affix corals to the reefs, but the main way is you go down with underwater drills fix the corals to the, the rock or the, whatever substrate you're working with, coral starts growing and the reef starts coming back to life. Wow. So it must really not surprise you to hear this report that came out that said that since the 1950s, we've lost about half of the world's corals. Not surprising, but still heartbreaking. It's tragic to see this incredible ecosystem disappearing in front of our eyes and I've been a diver since I was 13. This is a, something that really matters to me on a personal level, not to mention that's a critically important for the billion people around the world who depend on reefs for their livelihoods, for food security, for shelter from storms. It's a really sobering thought. Tell me, what do you think the future holds for coral reefs and for coral vita? I'll be the first person to say my job shouldn't exist. We, we can protect coral reefs so we don't need to restore them. So for our future at Coral Vita, we currently have our first coral farm operating uh, in Grand Bahama. Our ultimate vision is we want large-scale land-based coral farms working in every nation with reefs around the world. Well, thank you, Sam. You're doing incredible work, and I really look forward to seeing how your project grows in the future. I actually came across this really amazing video. Just take a look. It shows an elephant confronting a local bus in Kanora in South India. And this is because the road runs through this really dense forest that's home to loads of wild animals like elephants. Wow. And it just shows you the power of elephant. Here in Africa, habitat loss is actually the leading cause of human wildlife conflict, especially with elephant. Yeah, but it's all about 
just respecting that it is their habitats that you're going across and avoiding them as much as you can, staying out of their way. I completely agree. As much as humans need space, also all our important megafauna need their space to be able to coexist together. Something in the news that I found really interesting and actually pretty shocking was that our pets have doubled the carbon footprint of that of a Toyota Land Cruiser car. That's a crazy statistic. I mean, I have a Land Cruiser and I can't even imagine how my dog has more emissions than that. Actually, it's because of their diets and what we feed them. Loads of dogs are overweight and it's mainly due to the amount of meat that we're feeding them. And as lots of people know now, beef that we're feeding our dogs has a huge environmental impact. Yeah, I mean, Ella, I've come from a family where growing up we've been surrounded by dogs. But now I'm starting to think that it's much better just to go for one. Yeah, absolutely. There are things that we can all be doing in our own lives to help. Like with Griff here, we're going to try feeding him dog food made from insects and, and reduce his meat intake. So there's a few things that we can all try out to try and help. Ella, have a look at this. Oh, wow. So this guy is a real character. He's called Benjamin Von Wong, and he's an artist and environmental activist from Canada and he's come up with an installation called Turn Off the Plastic Tap, where he is trying to highlight how it's actually the production of plastic that we need to tackle because it's not slowing down. So he's gone and done these incredible installations to try and bring our attention to try and stop the production of plastic. Yeah, that's so cool. And whereabouts are the installations? So he first did the installation in five places across Canada and each place represented an aspect of plastic that he's trying to focus on. So for example, he did one installation at a beach, you know, highlighting how we're choking the oceans full of plastic. He did another installation at a landfill to show that even if we throw away plastic, it hasn't really gone away. And he also did an installation in a kid's playground to just highlight the fact that we're leaving the future generations with all this plastic. Now the installation is up in Paris, in France. Actually, to Howie, I coincidentally found a pretty similar story. There's a tunnel made from plastic in Indonesia, and it's all collected from a local river to the city of Surabaya. It was made by environmental activists from a group called Ecoturn, and it's all about highlighting the conditions of the local river and how bad they are with all the plastic in them. It's incredible to see that around the world, so many people are talking about plastic pollution, but also talking about how we can stop it. So, Jahawi, in the UK, a new sustainable aviation fuel has just been announced, and EasyJet are actually using a mixture of biofuel and normal jet fuel for some of their flights. But I'm really struggling to think, is this actually sustainable? They actually do use a combination of, you know, old cooking fats and sometimes fat from animals. So I think that's a fantastic step that all the other airlines should take. Compared to the normal fossil jet fuels, it releases 80% less uh, greenhouse gases, but at the moment, people are needing to use a mixture of this biofuel as well as normal jet fuel. You know, I think as amazing as these new technologies are, it will still take a bit of time before you know they can really become mainstream and we can see the impact. And as of now, we should actually still just be reducing the amount we fly. Yeah, absolutely. Aviation is a massive polluter, uh, so just using different types of fuel won't fully solve the issue. So, to continue our theme of eco-travel, I came across this article about a German company that is developing the tech to have tarmac that wirelessly charges your electric car as you drive. What? That's insane! How does that work? So this German company is called Magment, and they've figured out a way to sort of incorporate these magnetic particles within the concrete so that it can conduct a charge which then wirelessly transfers the energy to your car, much like you have your wireless charging on your phone. Would that mean that you wouldn't have to wait for your car to charge at a service station when you're driving? Theoretically, it would mean that, yes, you can actually just drive and your car is constantly being recharged. And it could be revolutionary. In Indiana, they're actually going to try and make a test road to see just how viable it is. 
Another really positive development that I found that's in the food industry is that McDonald's are making a muck plant burger in the UK and the US. So this would be using Beyond Meat, which is a meat-free alternative that's made from potatoes, peas and rice. And I can tell you as a vegan family, it's definitely one of our favourite alternatives. It's really amazing to see more of these plant-based alternatives even in fast food chains now which is really exciting and I know I'm definitely going to try it at some point. Would you be willing to try it Jahawi? You know I'm not vegan but I'd be definitely happy to try because anything that goes towards saving this world, bringing down our CO2 emissions, I think is a positive step forward. But you know what? There isn't even a McDonald's in Kenya. Oh, wow, that's really surprising. You know, in the developing world, most of the people are actually on plant-based diets mainly. And meat is something that you have at special occasions. And maybe if we all looked at meat that way as something for special occasions, we could cut down meat consumption greatly. Yeah, that's a lot more sustainable. And that's about it for this week, but these are all topics that will be coming up at the annual UN COP26 climate conference, which I'll actually be reporting from in Glasgow next time. Amazing. I look forward to hearing what you make of that. Bye. Bye.